Hi, everyone. I would like you to meet Professor Carlos Duarte. He's one of the greatest scientists of our generation, and he's the one who created the strategy for rebuilding marine life by 2050. So, Professor, could you please tell for those who don't know, what is the problem with oceans and why do we need to rebuild marine life? Yeah, so first, uh, Ria, let me thank you for having me in your, in your space and uh, uh, having me introduce to your audience and be able to share my thoughts with your audience. So uh, the problem with the oceans is that uh, uh, they still remain largely uh, unexplored. And at the same time, we have uh, impacted heavily on marine life and the health of the oceans. So basically, uh, since the Industrial Revolution, we have lost about half of the abundance of marine life and half of the habitats, and in some cases, even more. And at this time in the 21st century, then uh, we really need the oceans to help us uh, find a sustainable future. The oceans are great allies in that enterprise. And to be able to find a pathway to a sustainable future, we need to be supported by a healthy ocean. But the uh, biggest risk of, risk of all is that uh, the public loses hope that we can actually uh, improve the oceans because the time we give up on the oceans, the oceans will give up on us. And uh, how would you describe the plan that you created and what does it consist of? So the plan uh, requires five, uh, I would say five uh, major uh, actions. One of them is that we need to protect spaces, uh, spaces in the ocean. Uh, we need to pro protect species we need to harvest the ocean wisely, we need to remove pollution, and we need to mitigate climate change. And also we need to better understand the ocean, so that's a sixth uh, wedge that we need to deliver, and that requires science and research and exploration. So in your plan, uh, one of the things that you mentioned uh, was the seaweed farming. And uh, what is the role of it uh, in the plan? And uh, could you tell more about it? Yeah, so uh, seaweed, along with many other sea creatures, have been relatively neglected. In fact, the term, the term seaweed itself already is kind of negative about the, the role and beauty and aesthetics of these uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms. But seaweed uh, uh, stand out as for us to, for a sustainable uh, future. So uh, seaweed uh, is a... Uh, is, uh, 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 seaweed agriculture is an industry that can grow across most of the ocean because every single hectare of ocean is fertile and can support growth of seaweed. And while seaweed grow in the ocean, uh, it actually improves the marine ecosystem. So it uh, delivers oxygen to the uh, waters. It also uh, elevates the pH and removes carbon dioxide. So it creates refugia from ocean acidification but also sequesters carbon in the sediments below, uh, below the farm. And seaweed agriculture is very sustainable because we don't need to uh, fertilize the farms. We don't need to uh, use pesticides and we don't need to use herbicides. So it's chemically free and it also helps us improve water quality. So all of that uh, seaweed agriculture does while uh, the plants are growing in the ocean, in the farm, but the real benefits in, in, uh, in seaweed agriculture start when we harvest the plants because they are now able to produce a growing slate of products. So from healthy food to humans, to high value, value, uh, value molecules as nutraceuticals, cosmetics, uh, uh, materials for the pharma industry and medical treatments, but also including uh, polymers to uh, display synthetic plastics. I know, Ria, that you feel strongly about the need to uh, shift away from synthetic plastics and manage them better. So the seaweed provide a solution for your uh, concern because we can uh, deliver now polymers from seaweed that can be used across all of the ranges that we're using synthetic plastics, including the fashion industry and many other uh, applications. And also, uh, surprisingly, we have just learned that if we feed a, a cattle ruminants, if we feed seaweed to ruminants, that actually has health benefits for the animals. So they are healthier and their growth improves, but it also shuts down the methane production by ruminants. 
and methane production by cows and uh, sheep and other ruminants is responsible for 40% of the methane emissions to the atmosphere. And methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. So that actually goes a long way into also helping uh, us with uh, climate change mitigation. And uh, except uh, ecological benefits, are there immediate benefits for the ordinary people? Yeah, so uh, in fact, uh, we may start by uh, looking at seaweed, which we just discussed, and then we can look at the broader benefits from rebuilding the abundance of life in the oceans. So for the ordinary people, uh, I would say uh, a healthy ocean is of benefit to the ordinary people because our own health depends st strongly on a healthy ocean, so there's that, that link. Also, our own health depends strongly on the supply of healthy uh, food from the oceans, and both seaweed and fish sustainable, sustainably are essential in, uh, in uh, supporting our health, particularly the health of women uh, in both uh, the reproductive health, but also the uh, adequate development of the cognitive and brain capacities of our babies and children. So it's particularly important for women uh, but important across all, uh, all the population. Also, uh, seaweed uh, farming, which is a, an industry with only in the, as an industry, only 40 years old, although in Japan, we are working with farms that have been already in operation for 300 years. But this farming, it requires low tech, it's very simple, requires very low investment, you don't need to purchase land, and it has allowed uh, many uh, people in the developing uh, to be able to uh, uh, develop uh, sustainable livelihoods uh, for themselves and improve their well-being. And particularly, again, women have benefited. So in Africa, Zanzibar, and other nations, and also in Indonesia, it is actually the women that are the farmers of the ocean. And that role and the benefits and the income that they bring to the household has actually raised the social profile of women and empowered them to be, uh, have a stronger voice in their communities in Africa and Asia. And then in our own, uh, in the Western world, in New York and whatever your audience is uh, following us from, then uh, rebuilding the oceans also play uh, an important role because uh, it, it will be a major source of jobs in the future and actually well-paid jobs. And we have calculated that for every dollar that we invest in rebuilding the abundance of marine life, we can actually recover $10 in monetary benefits from that investment. So it's actually a very good business proposition for businessmen, but for the ordinary people, it will create first uh, income and jobs, but it will create a bright future for, for uh, our children and your generation, which uh, probably are not seeing much of a, of a bright future in the, uh, ahead of us. So creating a bright future, um, and delivering back to you and your children a notion that is boiling with life that that as that that my grand grandparents knew I think it's a legacy from our generation which is responsible to of many of the damages in the planet to your generation and future generations so there's a also a, a benefit that goes across generations and the window of opportunity to do that is very narrow so we, we need to take action now and we have 10 years to uh, put in place the strategies that will allow this. So the, the window is narrow and is rapidly uh, uh, closing. So we need to take action now. And uh, I would like to uh, uh, finish uh, my long reply to your question with one thought. And is that now uh, we're very much concerned about climate change and the impacts that it will bring to our societies and the world. And we uh, often think about greenhouse gases as being a main driver of climate change. But before we use uh, coal and gas uh, in our industries, uh, the streets of New York, the streets of North America and Europe were actually uh, lighted with the oil from whales. So we have literally burned whales uh, to derive energy. And wouldn't it, wouldn't it be wonderful that carbon that is now in the atmosphere as carbon dioxide generating problems will sometime in the future be carbon that will be in the ocean as living carbon, being whales or being seals or being sharks and other wonderful creatures. Because uh, uh, 
rebuilding the ocean also help us decarbonize the atmosphere to recarbonize the biosphere. And uh, what findings in your research enabled you to see the opportunity to rebuild marine life by 2050? Mm. Yeah, so I have about uh, almost 40 years of experience in marine research and uh, I've been working all across the ocean from uh, polar, from the Arctic to Antarctica, from the tropics uh, in the shallow waters and coral reefs to the deep sea. And I think by the end of the last millennium, uh, so by year 2000, I didn't have a lot of uh, uh, evidence to hold to claim that uh, restoring the abundance of the ocean was possible. Because basically most of the findings uh, were negative and I myself have seen a number of ecosystems that I work with disappear during my lifetime, which actually brings me a significant pain to have witnessed that. Uh, but then uh, something great has happened over the last decade and is that suddenly uh, news of positive developments in the ocean started to appear. And, you know, uh, our mass media uh, really dwells on negative news and very dramatic news. So these uh, small victories, uh, small positive developments were not being uh, celebrated. They didn't make it to the headlines of newspapers. So I'm, I'm very grateful to you to give a, a, a voice and share this news with your audience. Uh, uh, but uh, if, uh, if you kept your ear uh, close to the, to the railway track, you could hear a wave of ocean recovery coming back. And the seeds for this recovery actually were seeded in the 70s and 80s, where uh, some international, international policies were put in place, for instance, to stop hunting whales, to remove uh, pollution from lead in gasoline that was going into the ocean and uh, protected areas started. And uh, about 30 years later now, we start to see the benefits from those actions. And it was realizing the rapid response of the ocean to those policies that uh, provided me with confidence that we know how to uh, rebuild the oceans and we actually can do it if we start working on that now. And uh, has anything been implemented so far? Yes, yeah, so in fact, uh, we have gone a, a long way. So I finished my uh, response to your last question by talking about whales. So I, will give, I would like to give a credit to, a, for instance, humpback whales. So humpback whales are some of the largest uh, animals that live in our planet. And by year 1978, there were only 200 uh, humpback whales left in the ocean. And everybody thought we'll wave them goodbye and see them go extinct. But due to the uh, regulation of hunting that actually ap applies across all whales, now we have seen the numbers of uh, humpback whales surge in the ocean from 200 to more than 60,000. We can see the same in many other marine animals that were endangered, and now they're coming back uh, from uh, sharks, uh, turtles, and other whales and seals. Uh, of course, this not, doesn't apply to all of the animals, but we're seeing many uh, small victories, uh, bringing uh, some animals that were endangered to uh, to levels of abundance that we had seen only generations away in the past. But we have also made uh, many other uh, advances. For instance, by year 2000, when I was a little depressed about the state of the ocean, then the area of the ocean that was protected was only about 0.3%. By now, 2020, uh, we are already approaching 10% of the ocean uh, protected. In fact, we're about 8%. But just in the next weeks, there's going to be a major decision to establish the largest marine protected area in the world in Antarctica. So if that decision comes through, we will reach the goal of 10%. And in fact, from year 2000, we have been expanding the area of the ocean that is protected by 8% per year. So if we continue at that pace, we will, have, we will protect 30% of the ocean by year uh, 2030 which is a major goal and again is doable. And also by year 2000, uh, we were not uh, repairing ecosystems. So uh, restoration efforts were few and sparse and they have really surged uh, over the past two decades. So by now to 2020, the number of restoration projects are restoring salt marshes, mangroves, coral reefs, uh, oyster beds and many other habitats in the ocean are actually 900% more 
than they were at the beginning of the, of the century. And we start seeing also a wave of interest in these ecosystems and also in created habitats like seaweed, aquaculture, because many investors are searching for opportunities to uh, offset emissions and achieve their carbon neutrality goals, are seeing opportunity in rebuilding uh, marine habitats because they uh, serve a role as very intense carbon sinks. And I think that's going to give uh, an uh, additional momentum to our growing efforts to restore the oceans and rebuild uh, marine life. And what do you think people should focus on and what can, can they do to help? Well, everybody is uh, helping. Uh, you, Ria, are, are helping a lot. Uh, for instance, now you're allowing me to, uh, to uh, share my views with uh, your many uh, followers. And you yourself have been campaigning also uh, to uh, find a solution for plastic waste and plastic in the ocean. And that, uh, and that campaign is not only uh, possible for uh, people that have a, a big voice like yourself or scientists, everybody can participate because it starts with a role when we take the supermarket cart and we enter in the shopping mall and the supermarket. That's where a fight for the oceans start because we can choose to, uh, to uh, focus on products that are sustainable. So there are certification uh, systems that certify that your uh, healthy seafood that you consume, fish and other seafood is sustainably produced. So I would suggest that we focus on that and in doing so, we will help uh, fisheries become sustainable. And in fact, that is another area where we've made already a lot of progress. And we calculate that if we uh, expand the number of fisheries that are fish sustainably, we can actually rebuild the fisheries stocks in 20 years. So again, it is possible, but we need you and we need everybody that is uh, with us today to be able to do their, take their share in managing uh, their lives uh, through sustainable uh, consumption options. So we actually don't need to uh, go through, through great, great pains or, or feel uh, remorses about our behavior. We just need to uh, demand that in the society where we live, we are presented with options to fulfill our needs that are sustainable. And in fact, I see a lot of uh, momentum also in that and that big corporations are now uh, tuning to the desire of their clients and their uh, customers to be offered uh, products and services that are sustainable. So please take a look at labels, take a look, uh, be aware of uh, sustainable pra practices and accreditation systems and guide your lives through those principles. So you are optimistic about the future? Well, in fact, I've been thinking a lot about the term optimism. And uh, the term optimism, sometimes it's a, a, a bit simple because it kind of implies that if I'm optimism, I believe that everything is going to go well simply because things will go well at the end. So rather than optimist, optimist I would like to think of myself as being a hopeful person because hope is a birth that is a that requires that you roll up your sleeves. So uh, I can be hopeful because I know how hard it's going to be to achieve, achieve our goal, but I, I feel there is a moral imperative. And also I feel that we have the capacity to achieve it now. So I'm hopeful that we can do it because it makes sense, uh, because it will improve as uh, we were discussing earlier, uh, our livelihoods and our well-being, and because we can do it. So it's a moral obligation and then if I, I also said at the beginning that the biggest threat for the ocean is us giving up on the ocean. So I will encourage everybody to be hopeful, not maybe optimistic because optimism doesn't require much effort, but I will, I will encourage you all to join me in rolling up your sleeves and take on the job of restoring the, the, uh, the oceans with hope because we can do it.